The story starts in the flower capital. Odin was born in immense privilege, being the son and heir of the shogun of Wano, Kozuki Sukiyaki. Wano was a very powerful country, but it was closed off to the rest of the world due to its geography, and as a result was also closed off to foreign affairs and news from the outside world. So Odin's destiny was to grow up and eventually lead Wano, as the previous line of shoguns had done for the past 800 years, but if things went that way, we wouldn't have heard this story. To quickly sum up Odin's childhood, before the age of 1, he was strong enough to throw his nurse to the ground. At age 2, he was fast enough to catch two rabbits at once. At age 4, he killed a bear by throwing a boulder at it. At age 6, he was regularly visiting the pleasure halls. At age 8, he was addicted to gambling and getting drunk and brawling with the other gamblers. At age 9, he was blacklisted from entering the gambling den by the Yakuza, and in revenge set fire to the den and waged war on them. To sum it up, by the age of 10, Odin had already lived a life beyond the wildest dreams of any samurai, but he wasn't done yet. For all his crimes and antics, he was imprisoned in a quarry, and there he turned over a new leaf, becoming a chief stonemason. So when he left at 14 years old, he was more mature and selfless, and as a result, when the capital city was suffering from a drought, he couldn't bear to see the people suffering, so curved the entire river to flow into the capital, but he didn't realize that it would result in a gigantic flood, and once again led to a war on being put out for his arrest. So he took the chance to ride the river out of the country to escape, but failed. So he threatened a priest from a secluded mountain temple to shelter him, and would take women from the capital back there, but they were free to leave whenever they wanted, but chose to stay. So their husbands were outraged, as well as their fathers and brothers, and all of them came to battle Odin, and this conflict became known as the Harem War. He spent the next few years trying to set out to sea, a total of 38 times, but all of his attempts ended in total failure, until finally he turned 18, and at this point his father the shogun had enough of his son, and chose to disown him, but before he was served the papers, Odin was having a meal. He was cooking Odin, a stew consisting of various ingredients, but he was doing it over the cremation fires of a man, right over his bones. He cooked and ate the entire stew while the grieving family watched, and they were horrified, but after he was done, he spoke to the dead man, Katsuzo, saying his goodbyes, and that the next drink they would share would be in the afterlife. He then asked the family to pardon his intrusion, and left without another word, which moved and inspired them, especially the women. While he was walking through the streets, the city was in chaos. There was a huge fire, but it was being caused by something way bigger, the Mountain God, a legendary beast that was rampaging through the capital, because a young man named Kinemon had stolen the boar's child. Odin overheard this, and told Kinemon to give him the piglet. He tried to resist, saying he was planning to sell it, but the giant boar continued to rampage through the city, swallowing entire buildings along with the people inside them, and Kinemon learned that someone he loved had been swallowed as well, so rushed for the boar and stabbed it. Odin admired his bravery, but Kinemon was hopeless against the beast, so Odin picked up the piglet and showed it to the boar, getting it to charge towards him. Everyone saw this and assumed Odin had stolen the piglet and caused all this to happen, but Odin didn't care. He took out his two swords, and in one perfect move, sliced the mountain god in half. He saved everyone that was swallowed by the boar, so even though it destroyed a quarter of the capital, thanks to him, there were no casualties. Kinemon then tried to confess that he was guilty for the boar's attack, but Odin smacked him before he could say anything, allowing everyone to blame him for everything. To Odin, he had a horrible reputation anyway, and he didn't care about that, so might as well spare someone else from having their reputation ruined if he had the chance. He was then told that he was disowned, which also banished him from the capital but his response was simply that all this meant was the flower capital was unable to contain his greatness. So he was happy to leave, going wherever the sun set, and Kinemon, after what he'd done for him, said he would die for Odin, and Denjiro, a longtime admirer of Odin, felt the same, so they ran after him. That day, he left the flower capital, but they say that the one hesitant step of all the men who wished they could go with Odin caused the capital itself to tilt. Odin went to Hakumai to stay with Lord Yasue. He was like an uncle figure to him and was honest with him, calling him an idiot for being banished. Here, he also met a servant named Orochi. Odin called him creepy, but he looked and acted so pathetic that everyone felt sorry for him and kept him around. Odin and Yasue had conversations during this time. Yasue lectured him for not living up to his potential as the future shogun, but Odin responded that he was disowned and that Yasue should be the next shogun, but he got smacked. 
Yasui told him that he bared the Kozuki clan crest and that Sukiyaki only disowned him as an act of tough love and he should take that hint to change his ways. Odin said that was all well and good but he dreamed of going out to sea but the country didn't allow it. Wano was too cramped for him. He wanted to be free to go and do whatever he wanted but Yasui hit him again and scolded him for being selfish but Odin was too stubborn and didn't change his mind. After some time, Odin told Yasue that he was gonna leave and head for Kuri. He'd heard that there was an incredibly strong man there named Ashura Doji and wanted to challenge him. But Yasue warned him that Kuri was the cancer of Wano, a lawless area that the government had given up on entirely as a lost cause, to the point that if any criminal fled there, the authorities were powerless to get them back. Yasue said that it was so lawless that it might as well be another country. But all these things didn't scare or deter Odin. In fact, the opposite. It excited him. So he left Hakamai and made his way towards Kuri. Along the way, he asked how long Kinemon and Dendro would follow him, and they said as far as he would go and that they loved him. He didn't like that, but nonetheless didn't stop them. They were heavily devoted to him, even feeling it was their duty to stand in the rain to protect him, but he called them idiots and told them to get inside. They asked what he was doing, and he said he was keeping a journal. He heard the voyagers overseas wrote in them every day during their travels, so he wanted to do the same. So he logged all the events of his journey throughout Wano. They passed through Ringo, where they met two brothers, Kiku and Izo. They tried to make money dancing on the streets, but everyone rejected them. They were from a family of dancers, but their father got arrested, leaving them alone to fend for themselves. While they told their story, they just started eating Odin's Odin while crying, which annoyed him, but he didn't stop them, and when they left, the brothers followed along. They then went through Kibi, and found a freak named Kanjiro, and after Odin beat him up, he started following them as well. Then, deep in the forest of Udon, they encountered a ninja named Raizo, who had been in hiding after leaving the Kozuki clan after Kunoichi turned him down. He was sick of being on the run, so started following him as well. Finally, they made it just outside of Kuri, and Odin told everyone that he'd be going south to fertilize nature, whatever that meant, and his followers didn't question it. But when he didn't return for over a day, they realized that Kuri was south of there, and that he'd entered it without them. They all started panicking and ran to Kuri, guilty that they weren't there to protect him when he was in the most dangerous part of the country. Inside, the criminals were expecting Odin. The rules were that anyone could enter Kuri, but if they tried to leave, they'd be killed. But Odin disagreed, saying this lifestyle was cramped, there wasn't any way for people to live, and that being not allowed to leave was his least favorite rule. Then, jumped headfirst into a whole army of samurai, and after a whole day of fighting, he defeated every single one of them, including the infamous Ashura Doji. His followers finally arrived when the battle was done, finding Odin sitting on Ashura Doji. He told Odin to kill him, saying he had nothing to live for. So Odin asked his followers if they still loved him, and if they did, he asked them to lend him their wisdom and strength, since he decided that these worthless hooligans needed him as their king. And so, he rounded all the criminals and misfits of Kuri up, and started transforming the wasteland into a full-blown city. This impressed the entire country, even Odin's father, who retracted his disownment and named Odin the Daimyo of Kuri, considering it an official region of Wano. This was a monumental achievement that only Odin would be crazy enough to attempt, and one that only he could succeed at. Odin changed the lives of everyone in Kuri, especially Ashura Doji, who thanked Odin, saying that this was the first time he'd ever experienced peace. But Odin wasn't one for compliments or gratitude. He then got serious. As daimyo, he needed vassals, but he didn't want to be assigned some stuck-up nobles, and even though he didn't ask or want them to follow him in the first place, he wanted them to be his samurai. They all burst out in tears and started hugging him, but he threw them off, getting annoyed, but he didn't regret his decision. Years passed with Odin as Kuri's daimyo, and his followers now being his official vassals. One day while Odin was out fishing, he saw that his citizens had strung up a cat, dog, and cap on posts and were hitting them with sticks. Odin was angered, beating them all up, and started scolding them. Their fear of the unknown exposed their ignorance, and it caused them to torment little children. Satisfied with the lesson he taught, Odin started walking away, but the three of them yelled that he didn't get them down from the posts, so he reluctantly did and they followed him back to his castle. They started eating his Odin and thanked him for saving them. The cat and dog were called minks, a tribe of talking animals who had a long time alliance with the Kozuki family, and the Kappa was actually a fishman who washed up on Wano. Odin was intrigued by all these different species and thought that there would be even more unique things out there in the vast world and he couldn't wait to see them. Owen told the three of them to be safe, but they all jumped on him and begged him to let them stay. And so, he had no choice once again, and gained three new vassals. But they had a problem, they were running out of money, and a big reason for that was Owen kept lending Orochi their money. He was one of Yasui's men, so Owen felt he couldn't abandon him. 
Odin, despite what he said and how he acted, was incredibly kind and gracious. He couldn't turn a blind eye to suffering. Even if he didn't have the best methods of dealing with it, like when he accidentally flooded the capital, he still had to do something. But now, his city of Kuri was suffering for it, but his vassals didn't blame him, and instead took matters into their own hands. They snuck into Hakamai and attempted to steal money from Yasue, but he caught them. He asked why they stole, and they told him it was for Odin, and if he wanted to kill them, to get it over with. But he said they could keep the money, and even gave them extra. They were shocked and asked if it was a trap, but he just told them that if they loved Odin, to use the money to clean themselves up, practice manners, buy books, learn things. If he had ruffians for vassals, he would embarrass himself. One day, he would be the Shogun of Wano. Those that served and supported him had to be the greatest samurai in the land. They didn't just have to protect Odin, but the capital as well. And the nine of them would eventually become the country of Wano's guardian deities. Three years later, they were set to bring a procession to the capital, and everyone called Odin's vassals thugs, even thinking they would steal from the capital, but it was the opposite. They brought a procession not just worthy of a daimyo, but of a shogun. It was said that the weight of their arrival upon the gathering crowd was so great that it caused the capital itself to sink, just a little bit. Odin met with his father, who was shocked to his core that changed to Odin, but he replied that he hadn't changed at all and had only been made great by his vassals. He'd heard that his father was ill, but he was relieved to see him invigorated. However, that would be the last time they saw each other. Later, they returned to Kuri, and there, Odin heard the news that a pirate crew washed up on the shore, and he was brimming with excitement. He rushed to meet them, and the first thing he did was test the strength of their captain. Then, impressed by his power, asked to join his crew. After things settled down, they got to talking. The pirate's name was Edward Newgate, the legendary pirate Whitebeard, though no one in Wano knew it as they couldn't get outside information. Odin said he wanted to go out to sea and have an adventure, but his vassals shouted that he couldn't, but he didn't care, and asked again. But Whitebeard said he wasn't the type of person that could serve someone else, and that if he wanted to travel, he'd have to get his own ship. But Odin said that he tried dozens of times, but had no skill for sailing. His vassals then made an agreement with Whitebeard to not let Odin on his crew, but Odin was annoyed, he just wanted to have his adventure and see the world, and that night, he intended to. He snuck out of the castle and lashed onto Whitebeard's ship with a chain. Izo rushed after him, knowing this would happen, and grabbed onto him. They started getting dragged through the ocean by Whitebeard's ship, and Odin enthusiastically yelled to Whitebeard to show him the world. So Whitebeard gave him a challenge. If he could hold onto the chain for three days, he would let him on his ship, and Odin gleefully accepted. And so, through thunderous rain, sea monster infested waters, and even mountains, Odin held on with an iron grip, until finally, there was only one hour left, and by this point, after seeing his dedication, the entire Whitebeard crew started cheering him on, cause soon, he would be one of them. But, he let go. He'd heard a woman being attacked by slavers, so, as per usual, he couldn't bear to stand by while someone was in need, and went to save her. By this point, the Grand Line Ocean had left his body ruined with infection and injury, leaving him looking more like a sea creature than human, and this appearance made the slavers run away in fear. And after that, Odin couldn't bear to stay conscious, and passed out. He woke up a day later, having healed up completely with his freakish genetics. He said it was too bad he couldn't get onto Whitebeard's ship, but even still, he was on foreign land for the first time, so he was optimistic. The woman he saved that nursed him back to health was named Toki, and Owen thanked her, but was disappointed to see that she was wearing traditional Wano clothing, thinking people would dress differently overseas. But she said that actually her dream was to go to Wano, and asked him to take her there, but he didn't hide his disdain at that idea. But at that moment, Whitebeard returned, and told Odin to get on his ship. Odin was confused, he failed the challenge, but Whitebeard just told him they were going on a grand adventure, beyond anything he could ever imagine, and called him his little brother. When he got back on the ship, he discovered that Dogstorm and Cat Viper had stowed away, so it couldn't be helped. Those two, along with Izo, would accompany him on his voyage. Whitebeard also allowed Toki to come along, and so, his adventure finally began. He saw a vast and wondrous world beyond anything from his wildest dreams. He experienced weather that he never thought was possible, plants and animals that were unthinkable, people, strength, ideas, everything was new and different to him, everything surpassed his imagination. 
I wouldn't learn how the world worked, about the four blues in Grand Line. Wano was so small compared to all of it, and this excited him. During their travels, Odin got to know Toki. She told him that Wano was her parents' homeland, and that was why she wanted to go there. But he said that Whitebeard's ship wouldn't go back there for a long time, so she was unlucky. But she responded that just being around him made her feel like she reached her destination. Odin was clueless as to what she meant, and she remained coy with him. But regardless, whether he knew it or not, their relationship was blooming. And during the second year of their travels, they had a son. Owen said that his name had to tell the world he was invincible, so he named him Kozuki Momonosuke. Around this time, Whitebeard named Odin his second division commander, which he tried to turn down but was forced into it. As they continued to travel, Odin just wanted to see more and more and wasn't satisfied. He was searching for an answer but didn't know what it was. But back in Wano, a storm was brewing. Orochi, the man that Odin pitied and helped so many times, was plotting to take over the entire country. He had the help of someone that ate a dull fruit that allowed them to transform into anyone, and they used his power to turn to Odin himself and his father, and made everyone believe that Orochi was close to Odin, like a brother, and that the Shogun wanted him to be next in line for the throne. But since no information could leave Wano, Odin had no idea what was going on. Four years into Odin's journey, he and Toki had a daughter named Hyori, and at this time, they land on an island that appeared to be no different from any other on the Grand Line. But what made it special was who was on it. Goldie Roger, Whitebeard's greatest rival. But Odin didn't care. He ran straight at him like he would any other enemy pirate. He easily defeated the weaker members of Roger's crew. So, he was met by Roger himself. Yo, Samurai! Come, Sorry! <laughs> Odin couldn't believe his strength. He hadn't felt something like that since he clashed with Whitebeard four years before, but he got back up and started running back. But before he could, Whitebeard leapt at Roger, and they clashed. This shocked Odin to his core. They were both so powerful, they didn't even touch blades when they clashed. But before he could think more about it, the two captains declared that the crews would go into battle. And so, all of them fought for the next three days and nights. But eventually, things cooled down and they got to talking like they were old friends. Roger brought out a text in the language of the Poneglyphs, and Owen said he could read it. The knowledge to do so had been passed down through the Kozuki family for 800 years. Roger revealed that him and his crew followed the log post all the way to Lodestar, where no one had reached before. They thought it was the final island, but it wasn't. There was one more. And in order to get there, they had to find four red Poneglyphs, known as Road Poneglyphs, which, when combined together, would reveal the location of that final island. The stories say that a vast treasure awaits whoever arrives at that final island, and if they got there, they would be the world's greatest pirate crew. Then Roger said something that made Odin freeze. For the second time that day, he was stunned. But then, Roger asked Whitebeard to let him take Odin for a year, and he was sure that with him, he could reach the final island. He bowed down, begging for this, and Odin tried to stop him, asking him not to embarrass himself. But Whitebeard was livid, saying he was trying to steal his family from him, and started destroying the island in rage. But Odin was thinking. His ancestry called out to him. It asked why the Kozuki family could read these letters. Why did he meet Roger at this time? And before he knew it, the words left his mouth. He asked Whitebeard to let him go with Roger. Whitebeard was opposed, not wanting to lose Odin, who had been his little brother for four years. But Odin begged him, saying it was only one year. So, Whitebeard relented. Odin's three vassals who had been traveling with him said they would stay on Whitebeard's ship and wait for him to return and he said that was their right and everyone should be free to choose. Whitebeard was still annoyed that Odin chose to leave, but he accepted it, and the rest of the crew gave him a send off. So, after four years, maybe now, Odin would find the answer he was searching for. It was the second act of his life as a pirate, a brand new adventure. He thought to himself that he was so lucky to meet two men as great as Whitebeard and Roger, and get to travel with both of them. At first, the crew was hostile, saying their captain only needed him for his knowledge, and not to assume they accept him as one of their own. But Odin didn't really care, and just did his own thing. They landed on a port town where Odin stole a bunch of ingredients, and when they got back on board the ship, he made a signature Odin, and that was what won over the entire crew to him. They all started cheering Odin, and he said that was him. He was Odin, and he was born to boil. Odin was then told that Roger only had a year left to live, and that was why he was so desperate to finish his journey. The Roger Pirates went on adventures beyond even what Odin experienced on the Whitebeard Pirates. They were blasted into the sky by a giant pillar of water, and there they found an entire new ocean and islands all in the sky. The world was bigger and grander than Odin ever could have pictured. While they were on the Sky Island, they found a massive golden bell, and next to it, there was a 
Poneglyph, but it wasn't a red one like they needed. So Roger told Odin to carve a message for him into the bell, and Odin thought to himself they want Roger to show it to him, the final chapter of his grand life-spanning adventure. They then descended back into the blue sea, and further down to go beyond the depths into Fishman Island. During the descent, Roger heard a voice, and Odin heard it too, but no one else could. They made it to Fishman Island and found one of the road poneglyphs. They went back up to the surface and headed for Wano, but during the trip, Toki fell sick, so she had no choice but to end her journey there and disembark on Wano. Odin said he'd go with her, but Toki refused, saying if he was the type of man to give up on his dreams now, she'd get a divorce. He had to follow through and complete this journey of a lifetime. They landed and Odin's vassals were glad to see him and tried to tell him what was going on in Wano, but Toki stopped them, saying that they cared about Odin to let him leave. As he turned his back on Wano, he knew there was something terrible brewing, but he could sense that if he found out what it was, he would never go out to sea again. This goes back to his nature of never turning his back on someone in need and having to step in no matter what, so he couldn't find out what was going on until his journey was complete. He took a copy of the road poneglyph that was on Wano and got back on Roger's ship, and now, it was time for the final poneglyph, which was located in the country that sat on top of a giant elephant, Zo. When they approached it, Odin got a strange feeling, but he didn't know what it was, and Roger felt it too. It felt like something huge was watching them, but nonetheless, they found it, the final road poneglyph. They deciphered all of them, and pinpointed the final island's location, and Roger ordered them to set sail immediately. And on that day, they learned the entire truth of the world, what the Hundred Year Void was, what the people of the D were, what the ancient weapons were. In the past, Wano was open to the world, and in the face of the vast treasure on that final island, which was very real indeed, Roger just laughed, and so did the rest of them. They laughed until tears sprang to their eyes, Joy Boy had left behind a tale full of laughs. And so, Roger decided to name this island that hadn't been reached in 800 years, Laugh Tale. Odin had found it, all the answers to his questions. He went from knowing nothing about the world outside of Wano to discovering the secrets of the entire world that only him and a handful of people knew about. He had found and accomplished more than what should have been possible. So there was nothing else to do, and the same went for the rest of the crew. So Roger disbanded the Roger Pirates. Roger got off the ship and waved goodbye, but this was a man's farewell. They were utterly stoic, not a single tear was shed, for the crew of the King of the Pirates would never cry. Their next stop was Wano to drop Odin off, and during the voyage, he said that before there was a purpose to Wano being closed off from the rest of the world, but now they had to open his ports before Joy Boy returned. We don't know what he learned on Laugh Tale or what his reasons were, but this was now Odin's number one wish to open Wano. They arrived and Odin got off the ship, saying goodbye to the Roger Pirates, saying they would one day meet again. Toki jumped into his arms along with his children. He was finally back, satisfied, having seen everything the world had to offer. But now, it was time to hear about the situation he neglected earlier. Odin's father passed away, and Orochi had taken the position of Shogun, having successfully tricked everyone into believing he was close to Odin, and that the previous Shogun wanted him to take over. Orochi built factories, where he forced the people of Wano to work and build weapons for him, and the reason everyone had no choice but to obey him was that he had gotten the support of the pirate Kaido, but after a while, the people of Wano were sick of this, and one man refused to work, but in response, his family was executed, and this was the last straw for Odin's vassals. They marched to the flower capital to overthrow Orochi, but while they were gone, Kaido's followers snuck into Kuri, infiltrated the castle, and threatened the life of Momonosuke. Kawamatsu and Dogstorm were able to drive them away, but in the chaos, Toki was hit by an arrow while protecting Momonosuke. Odin's vassals hung their heads after telling him this, apologizing for putting his family in danger, but Odin didn't blame them. He asked Toki to show him the wound, and he saw a massive scar. He embraced her for protecting Momonosuke, but she could see him boiling with rage. She said he couldn't get angry over something trivial like this, but he responded that she didn't know the stories of his past, and then told his men to stay there and protect his family, while he grabbed his swords and leapt out of the castle. He was enraged, not only at what Orochi did to his family, but what he was doing to all of Wano, and this was why he knew he couldn't hear about this before his voyage was done, because he wouldn't be able to control what he did next. 
he rampaged through the shogun's palace, defeating every soldier in his way in devastating fashion until he reached Orochi. He rushed forward, and Orochi pleaded for him to think about what would happen if he killed him, but Odin said that he'd think about it after he sliced him in two, but he was blocked by devil fruit. The barrier fruit prevented any attack from getting through it, no matter how powerful, so Odin couldn't do anything to Orochi. Kaido then arrived, and Orochi revealed they had a gift for him, a stock of weapons, and hundreds of people that he kidnapped to be sold, tortured, or killed. Odin was furious and clashed with Kaido, but Orochi made a suggestion. He said he could stop the kidnappings. If he went to the center of town and danced like a fool every week, he would save a hundred lives with each dance. And after five years, Orochi and Kaido promised that they would sail away from Wano once they built ships for their crews to leave with, and he accepted. The people watched in disbelief as the man they thought would be their savior danced like a fool right on cue every single week, and their disappointment soon turned to anger. Odin's vassals begged him to tell them what was going on. They said that everyone, even his most loyal followers, lost hope in him. All of his citizens, even in his beloved city of Kuri that he built, shunned him. After a year of this, he got the news that Roger was executed, and he laughed with tears in his eyes, celebrating Roger's incredible life as he would have wanted. Odin continued to dance, but in between he spent time with his family, vassals, and friends constantly. And finally, the five years were up, with everything having been at a standstill for that time. And with that, Orochi came to Kuri, with Odin expecting him to announce his departure. But instead, he denied the deal they made, and doubled down, imprisoning Odin's dear friend Hyogoro. But during the struggle, Kaido's men killed Hyogoro's wife. This was the last straw. Kaido and Orochi lied about their deal and were starting to clamp down on the people of Wano. So, Odin told his vassals that the time had come for them to strike down Kaido. He sacrificed his dignity and reputation for 5 years of peace. Odin saved 100 lives every week for 5 years, totaling 26,000 lives saved. Even though none of the people he saved knew it, Odin danced and danced, not caring what anyone thought, just knowing he was doing the right thing, and that was all that mattered. Orochi and Kaido were still wary of his strength, so they didn't dare torment the people of Wano like they did before during those 5 years, but now they were, so Odin knew there was no option for peace. His nine vassals stood by him, under the crimson red sun. It shone like flames on their backs, and because of this, everyone watching would later call them the Nine Red Scabbards, the protectors of Wano that Yasuo had predicted they would become. And, alongside their leader, they went to battle. Odin didn't change his mind on not causing massive casualties, so he only brought his vassals. But unexpectedly, Kaido anticipated them and brought an entire army to meet them. Kaido mocked him for choosing the option that would save lives and not hurt anyone, saying that was what Roger and Whitebeard would have done. But Odin said he didn't regret it. During those five years, his people had peace, and he did too. He spent that time with his family and friends, building memories and moments that could be cherished. But now, it was time to look to the future. They ran to battle, and a ninja named Shinobu joined them. So, it was 11 samurai against a thousand pirates, but the battle lasted longer than expected, as Odin's strength surpassed the enemy's expectation. Odin fought through hundreds until he finally made it to Kaido, and with one beautiful technique, sliced his chest. Kaido collapsed, and Odin was about to strike the finishing blow, but just then, he heard Momonosuke's voice call out to him. He turned and saw his son with a knife to his neck, and his mind was scrambled, his defenses completely down, and Kaido delivered a lethal blow while Odin's back was turned. He was knocked down, bleeding from the head, and it was revealed that he hadn't seen Momonosuke, but the Delphi user that Orochi worked with to take over the country. Odin's vassals tried to save him, but the enemy took the chance to stab them in their backs as well. Odin and his nine vassals lost a battle, and were imprisoned, but the citizens just looked on in disdain, not knowing what they'd done for them in the battle, and indeed for the past five years as well. But soon after, their fate was announced. In three days time, the ten samurai would be sentenced to death by boiling. Odin stepped onto the execution platform. Kaido and Orochi laughed while the people criticized him for being a fool and weak. He was on the edge of the pot when he made a request. All ten of them would enter the pot together, and if any of them withstood the boiling for the amount of time Kaido chose, they would be free to leave. Kaido laughed and said an hour. Boiling, especially in oil, was an instant death sentence, lasting a few seconds at most. So Kaido decided to mock Odin and make a fool out of him by giving an impossible amount of time. Everyone watching agreed and called him pathetic and to just get his death over with. So, Odin jumped into the boiling hot oil and screamed out in excruciating pain. His vassals were about to jump in to join him, but Odin got a plank and ordered them to get on top of it. 
He held them all over his head, with him alone boiling in the pot of oil. They were all horrified, saying it should have been the other way around. They swore to protect him and give their lives to do so, but Odin ordered them to stay on top of the plank. The surrounding crowd was shocked, saying it took immense strength just to hold his vassals up, but to do it while being boiled at the same time was ludicrous. Shinobu was crying while she saw him struggle and suffer. The clock ticked by, one agonizing second at a time, but Odin grit his teeth, refusing to yield. His vassals begged him to put them down, but he kept going. The oil bubbled and burned. His vassals lifted above him felt as if the heat was going to roast them, so they could only imagine the horror their lord was experiencing. Blood started to pour out of Odin's entire body. Four minutes passed. The crowd said they were getting bored, that he wasn't screaming and dying quickly like they thought, so said they couldn't waste any more time on this fool of a lord. But this made Shinobu snap. She slammed the man who said that to the ground and threatened to kill him. She screamed out that they were the fools and revealed everything. Odin sacrificed his dignity and reputation so they could live in peace. That after his death, they would realize just how much misery he kept at bay. For all those years, Odin was protecting Wano. The people were in disbelief. It was too much for them to process. They begged Orochi to call off the execution, but he shot them. Only then did they realize the storm that was coming if Odin died. The man boiling in front of them was the final shining hope of Wano. The news spread throughout the whole crowd and through the entire country. They realized their devastating, shameful mistake. So the people that had forsaken him for the past five years started cheering for him. The pot surpassed 700 degrees and continued to rise, but they begged him to live. They apologized and thanked him, and he thanked them back. He didn't expect anything from them, he didn't care about their ridicule, it was nothing to him. But he appreciated their support, even if it was only at the final stretch. He said that if he survived the boiling, his wish was to open the country. He said that long ago, the Kozuki clan closed the country to protect it. But now, Wano and the entire world awaited a certain figure, and when that figure appeared, the country must be prepared to welcome them. He then admitted that he would be killed that day, but he wanted them to open up Wano in his stead, and his vassals said that his dream was their dream, and he was glad to hear it. 30 minutes remained. The oil was so hot that the heat even became lethal for Odin's vassals being held above, but Odin refused to die. The time dwindled down. 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 1 minute, 10 seconds, 3 seconds, 1 second and the crowd rejoiced. He survived the execution. But yet again, Kaido and Orochi lied. Their men pointed guns at Odin and his vassals, but Odin knew this would happen. He told his vassals to do it for him, open Wano's borders. Then he threw them all to safety, and they ran full speed towards Kuri, not being able to turn back, all in tears, remembering all the years they spent at Odin's side. Kaido said he would kill him, and that the age of Kozuki was over. But Odin said not to underestimate his samurai. Kaido said they would speak of his spectacular death for years to come, but Odin didn't care. Even if they forgot him, his soul would live on. And finally, he said that he was Odin, and he was born to boil. Odin was right, his soul lived on. His very presence emanated from all corners of Wano. His vassals, son, daughter, and every other person living in Wano cherished his memory, as well as some he would have never expected. Like Kaido's son, Yamato, who found his journal and read all about his magnificent journeys across the world and idolized him so much he wanted to be him. Everyone in Wano waited for the day when the Nine Red Scabbards, the guardians of Wano, would return and save them from the slavery and torment of Orochi and Kaido. And one day, they did, bringing along a certain man, the man Odin said they had to welcome, Joy Boy, the God of Liberation. He came and saw what was happening in Wano and worked alongside Momonosuke, and together they brought down Kaido, and Hiyori and Denjiro killed Orochi, fulfilling Odin's prophecy. Wano was finally free, and Momonosuke was able to take the position that his father was robbed of. He became the Shogun of Wano, and everyone saw his father in him. Kozuki Odin was unapologetically himself, from the day he was born till the day he died, and just by doing that, Along the way, he became beloved by his entire country, formed bonds with people all over the world, and changed the very course of history, all while never straying from who he was. He accomplished everything he ever wanted, and even got to give his people and family years of peace. Though he appeared to lose his life in a tragedy, his final moments didn't lie. He saw what would happen in the future, he was certain of it, and while he pictured it, died with a smile.